STORY I OF CHRISTMAS EVE AND CHRISTMAS DAY TEN CHRISTMAS STORIES BY EDWARD EVERETT HALE THIS LIBRIVOX RECORDING IS IN THE PUBLIC DOMAIN STORY ONE THEY SAW A GREAT LIGHT CHAPTER TWO TRIPS COVE PART TWO BUT EVEN IF THEY HAD MADE TOM A TURNPIKE KEEPER THEY WOULD NOT HAVE MADE LAURA A misanthrope. He, poor fellow, gladly accepted the appointment. She, sweet creature, as gladly accepted her part of it. Early March saw them on the bell and hammer. April saw the early flowers come, and May saw Laura with both her babies on the beach, laughing at them as they wet their feet, digging holes in the sand for them, and sending the bigger boy to run and put salt upon the tails of the peeps as they ran along the shore. And Tom Cutts, when his glass was clear to his mind, and the reflectors polished to meet even his criticism, would come down and hunt up Laura and the children. And when she had put the babies to sleep, old Mipples, who was another of the descendants of the Fighting 27th, would say, "'Just you go out with the Major, Mum, and if they wake up and I can't still em, I'll blow the horn.' Not that he ever did blow the horn." All the more certain was Laura that she could tramp over the whole island with Tom Cutts, or she could sit and knit or sew, and Tom could read to her. And these days were the happiest days of her married life, and brought back the old sunny days of the times before Fort Sumter again. Ah, me, if such days of summer and such days of autumn would last forever! But they will not last forever. November came, and the little colony went into winter quarters. December came, and we were all double-banked with seaweed. The stoves were set up indoors. The double doors were put on outside, and we were all ready for the Osprey. The Osprey was the government steamer which was to bring us our supplies for the winter, chiefly of colza oil and perhaps some coal. But the Osprey does not appear. December is half gone, and no osprey. We can put the stove on short allowances, but not our two lanterns. They will only run to the 31st of January. The nights are so long if the osprey does not come before then. That is our condition when old Mipples, bringing back the mail, brings a letter from Boston to say that the osprey has broken her main shaft and may not be repaired before the 15th of January that Mr. Cutts will therefore, if he needs oil, take an early opportunity to supply himself from the light at Squire's, and that an order on the keeper at Squire's is enclosed. To bring a cask of oil from Squire's is no difficult task to a Trips Cove man. It would be no easy one, dear reader, to you and me. Squire's is on the mainland, our nearest neighbor at the Bell and Hammer, it revolves once a minute, and we watch it every night in the horizon. Tom waited day by day for a fine day, would not have gone for his oil, indeed, till the new year came in, but that Jotham Fields, the other assistant, came down with a fever turn wholly beyond Laura's management, and she begged Tom to take the first fine day to carry him to a doctor. To bring a doctor to him was out of the question. "'And what will you do?' said Tom. "'Do? I will wait till you come home. "'Start any fine day after you have wound up the lights on the last beat. "'Take poor Jotham to his mother's house. "'And if you want, you may bring back your oil. "'I shall get along with the children very well, "'and I will have your dinner hot when you come home.' "'Tom doubted, but the next day Jotham was worse.' Mipples voted for carrying him ashore, and Laura had her way. The easier did she have it, because the south wind blew softly, and it was clear to all men that the run could be made to Squire's in a short two hours. Tom finally agreed to start early the next morning. He would not leave his sick man at his mother's, but at Squire's, and the people there could put him home. The weather was perfect, and an hour before daylight they were gone. They were all gone. All three had to go. Mipples could not handle the boat alone, nor could Tom. Far less could one of them manage the boat, take the oil, and see to poor Jotham also. 
Wise or not, this was the plan. An hour before daylight they were gone. Half an hour after sunrise they were at Squire's. But the sun had risen red and had plumped into a cloud. Before Jotham was carried up the cliff, the wind was northwest, and the air was white with snow. You could not see the house from the boat, nor the boat from the house. You could not see the foremast of the boat from your seat in the stern sheets. The air was so white with snow. They carried Jotham up, but they told John Wilkes, the keeper at Squire's, that they would come for the oil another day. They hurried down the path to the boat again, pushed her off, and headed her to the northeast, determined not to lose a moment in beating back to the bell and hammer. Who would have thought the wind would haul back so without a sign of warning? "'Will it hold up, Simon?' said Tom to Mipples, wishing he might say something encouraging. And all Simon Mipples would say was, "'God grant it may!' And Laura saw the sun rise, red and burning. And Laura went up into the tower next the house and put out the light there. Then she left the children in their cribs and charged the little boy not to leave till she came back and ran down to the door to go and put out the other light. And as she opened it, the blinding snow dashed in her face. She had not dreamed of snow before. But her waterproof was on, she pulled on her boots, ran quickly along the path to the other light, two hundred yards perhaps, climbed the stairway and extinguished that, and was at home again before the babies missed her. For an hour or two Laura occupied herself with her household cares, and pretended to herself that she thought this was only a snow flurry that would soon clear away. But by the time it was ten o'clock she knew it was a stiff nor'wester, and that her husband and Mipples were caught on shore. Yes, and she was caught with her babies alone on the island. Wind almost dead ahead to a boat from Squire's, too, if that made any difference. That crossed Laura's mind. Still, she would not brood. Nay, she did not brood, which was much better than saying she would not brood. It crossed her mind that it was the day before Christmas, and that the girls at Tripp's were dressing the meeting-house for dear old Parson Spaulding. And then there crossed her mind the dear old man's speech at all weddings, "'As you climb the hill of life together, my dear young friends!' And poor Laura, as she kissed the baby once again, had courage to repeat it all aloud to her and her brother, to the infinite amazement of them both. They opened their great eyes to the widest, as Laura did so. Nay, Laura had the heart to take a hatchet and work out to leeward of the house into a little hollow behind the hill, and cut up a savin bush from the thicket, and bring that in, and work for an hour over the leaves, so as to make an evergreen frame to hang about General Cutt's picture. She did this that Tom might see she was not frightened when he got home. When he got home! Poor girl! At the very bottom of her heart was the other and real anxiety, if he got home. Laura knew Tom, of course, better than he knew himself, and she knew old Mipples, too. So she knew, as well as she knew that she was rubbing black lead on the stove while she thought these things over, she knew that they would not stay at Squire's two minutes after they had landed Jotham Fields. She knew they would do just what they did, put to sea, though it blew guns, though now the surf was running its worst on the seal's back. She knew, too, that if they had not missed the island, they would have been here, at the latest, before eleven o'clock. And by the time it was one, she could no longer doubt that they had lost the island and were tacking about looking for it in the bay, if, indeed, in that gale they dared to tack at all. No, Laura knew only too well that where they were was beyond her guessing that the good God, and they too, only knew. Come here, Tom, and let me tell you a story. Once there was a little boy, and he had two kittens, and he named one kitten Muff, and he named one kitten Buff. Wang! What was that? Tom, darling, take care of the baby. Do not let her get out of the cradle while Mama goes to the door. 
downstairs to the door. The gale has doubled its rage. However did it get in behind the storm door outside? That wang was the blow with which the door, wrenched off its hinges, was flung against the side of the wood house. Nothing can be done but to bolt the storm door to the other passage, and bolt the outer window shutters, and then go back to the children. Once there was a little boy, and he had two kittens, and he named one Minna and one Brenda. No, Mamma, no! One Muff and one... Oh, yes, my darling! Once there was a little boy, and he had two kittens, and he named one Buff and one Muff. And one day he went to walk... Heavens! The lanterns! Who was to trim the lamps? Strange to say, because this was wholly out of her daily routine, the men always caring for it, of course, Laura had not once thought of it till now. And now it was after one o'clock. But now she did think of it with a will. Come, Tommy, come and help Mamma. And she bundled him up in his thickest storm rig. Come up into the lantern. Here the boy had never come before. He was never frightened when he was with her, else he might well have been frightened, and he was amazed there in the whiteness, drifts of white snow on the lee side and the weather side, clouds of white snow on the southwest sides and northeast sides, snow, snow everywhere, nothing but whiteness wherever he looked round. Laura made short shift of those wicks which had burned all through the night before, but she had them ready. She wound up the carcels for their night's work. Again and again she drew her oil and filled up her reservoirs. And as she did so, an old text came on her, and she wondered whether Father Spaulding knew how good a text it would be for Christmas. And the fancy touched her, poor child, and as she led little Tom down into the nursery again, she could not help opening into the Bible Parson Spaulding gave her, and reading, But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, while the bridegroom tarried, and they all slumbered and slept. Dear Tommy, dear Tommy, my own child, we will not sleep, will we? While the bridegroom tarried, oh, my dear Father in heaven, let him come. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And she devoured little Tommy with kisses, and cried, We will go, my darling, we will go, if he comes at the first hour, or the second, or the third. But now Tommy must come with Mamma and make ready for his coming. For there were the other lamps to trim in the other tower, with that heavy reach of snow between and she did not dare leave the active boy alone in the house. Little Matty could be caged in her crib, and even if she woke she would at best only cry. But Tom was irrepressible. So they unbolted the lee door and worked out into the snow. Then poor Laura, with the child, crept round into the storm. Heavens, how it raged and howled! Where was her poor bridegroom now? She seized up Tom, and turned her back to the wind, and worked along. Go, step sideway, sideway, the only way she could by step. Did it ever seem so far before? Tommy was crying. One minute more, dear boy. Tommy will see the other lantern, and Tommy shall carry Mama's great scissors up the stairs. Don't cry, my darling, don't cry. Here is the door just as she began to wonder if she were dreaming or crazy. Not so badly drifted in as she feared. At least she is under cover. Up a day, my darling, up a day. One, two, what a many steps for Tommy. That's my brave boy. And they were on the lantern deck again, fairly rocking in the gale, and Laura was chopping away on her stiff wicks and pumping up her oil again and filling the receivers, as if she had ever done it till this Christmas before. And she kept saying over to herself, Then those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And I will light them, said she aloud. 
That will save another walk at sundown. And I know these carcels run at least five hours. So she struck a match, and with some little difficulty coaxed the fibers to take fire. The yellow light flared luridly on the white snowflakes, and yet it dazzled her and Tommy as it flashed on them from the reflectors. "'Will anybody see it, Mama? said the child. "'Will Papa see it?' And just then the witching devil who manages the fibers of memory drew from the little crypt in Laura's brain, where they had been stored unnoticed years upon years, four lines of Lee Hunt's, and the child saw that she was hero. Then at the flame a torch of fire she lit, and o'er her head anxiously holding it, ascended to the roof, and leaning there, lifted its light into the darksome air. If only the devil would have been satisfied with this, but of course she could not remember that, without remembering Schiller. In the gale her torch is blasted, beacon of the hoped-for strand. Horror broods above the waters, horror broods above the land. And she said aloud to the boy, Our torch shall not go out, Tommy. Come down, come down, darling, with Mama. But all through the day horrid lines from the same poem came back to her. Why did she ever learn it? Why, but because dear Tom gave her the book himself, and this was his own version, as he sent it to her from the camp in the valley. Yes, tis he, although he perished, still his sacred troth he cherished. Why did Tom write it for me? And they trickle lightly playing o'er a corpse upon the sand. Oh, what a fool I am! Come, Tommy, come, Matty, my darling, Mamma will tell you a story. Once there was a little boy, and he had two kittens, and he named one Buff and one Muff. But this could not last forever. Sundown came, and then Laura and Tommy climbed their own tower, and she lighted her own lantern, as she called it. Sickly and sad through the storm, she could see the sister lantern burning bravely, and that was all she could see in the sullen whiteness. Now, Tommy, my darling, we will come and have some supper. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Yes, tis he, although he perished, still his sacred troth he cherished. Come, Tommy, come, Tommy, come, Tommy, let me tell you a story. But the children had their supper, asking terrible questions about Papa, questions which who should answer? But she could busy herself about giving them their oatmeal and treating them to ginger snaps, because it was Christmas Eve. Nay, she kept her courage when Tommy asked if Santa Claus would come in the boat with Papa. She fairly loitered over the undressing them. Little witches, how pretty they were in their flannel nightgowns! And Tommy kissed her and gave her, ah me, one more kiss for Papa and in two minutes they were asleep. It would have been better if they could have kept awake one minute longer. Now she was really alone, and very soon seven o'clock has come. She does not dare leave the clockwork at the outer lantern a minute longer. Tom and Mipples wind the works every four hours, and now they have run five. One more look at her darlings. Shall she ever see them again in this world? Now to the duty next her hand. Yes, the wind is as fierce as ever. A point more to the north, Laura notices. She has no child to carry now. She tumbles once in the drift. But Laura has rolled in snow before. The pile at the door is three feet thick. But she works down to the latch, and even her poor numb hand conquers it and it gives way. How nice and warm the tower is, and how well the lights burn! Can they be of any use this night to anybody? Oh, my God, grant that they may be of use to him! She has wound them now. She has floundered into the snow again. Two or three falls on her way home, but no danger that she loses the line of march. The light above her own house is before her so she has only to aim at that. Home again, 
and now to wait for five hours, and then to wind that light again at midnight. And at midnight there was a cry made, Oh, dear, if he would come, I would not ask for any cry. And Laura got down her choice inlaid box that Jem brought her from sea, and which held her treasures of treasures, and the dear girl did the best thing she could have done. She took these treasures out. You know what they were, do you not? They were every letter Tom Cutts ever wrote her, from the first boy note in print. Laura! these hedgehog quills are for you i killed him tom and laura opened them all and read them one by one each twice and put them back in their order without folding into the box at ten she stopped and worked her way upstairs into her own lantern and wound its works again she tried to persuade herself that there was less wind did persuade herself so but the snow was as steady as ever. Down the tower stairs again, and then a few blessed minutes brooding over Mattie's crib and dear little Tom, who has kicked himself right athwart her own bed where she had laid him. Darlings! They are so lovely. Their father must come home to see them. Back, then, to her kitchen fire. There are more of dear Tom's letters yet. How manly they are, and how womanly! She will read them all. Will she ever dare to read them all again? Yes, she reads them all, each one twice over, and his soldier diary, which John Wildair saved and sent home. And as she lays it down, the clock strikes twelve. Christmas Day is born. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Laura fairly repeated this aloud. She knew that the other carcel must be wound again. She dressed herself for the fight thoroughly. She ran in and trusted herself to kiss the children. She opened the lee door again and crept round again into the storm, familiar now with such adventure. Did the surf beat as fiercely on the rocks? Surely not. But then the tide is now so low. So she came to her other tower, crept up, and wound her clockwork up again, wiped off, or tried to wipe off, what she thought was mist gathering on the glasses, groped down the stairway, and looked up on the steady light above her own home. And the Christmas text came back to her. The star went before them, and stood above the place where the young child was. A light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of my people Israel. By the way of the sea, and this Laura almost shouted aloud, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them who sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Grant it, merciful Father, grant it for these poor children. And she almost ran through the heavy drifts till she found the shelter again of her friendly tower. Her darlings had not turned in their bed since she left them there. And after this Laura was at rest. She took down her Bible and read the Christmas chapters. It was as if she had never known before what darkness was or what the light was when it came. She took her hymn-book and read all the Christmas hymns. She took her keeble and read every poem for Advent and the hymn for Christmas morning. She knew this by heart long ago. Then she took Bishop Ken's Christian year, which Tom had given for her last birthday present, and set herself bravely to committing his Christmas day to memory. Celestial harps, prepare to sound your loftiest air, your choral angels at the throne, your customary hymns postpone. And thus, dear girl, she kept herself from thinking even of the wretched hero and Leander lines, till her clock struck three. Upstairs, then, to her own tower, and to look out upon the night. The sister flame was steady, the wind was all hushed, but the snow was as steady, right and left, 
behind and before. Down again, one more look at the darlings, and then, as she walked up and down her little kitchen, she repeated the verses she had learned, and then sat down to, You with your heavenly ray, gild the expanse this day, You with your heavenly ray, gild the expanse this day, You with your heavenly ray. Dear Laura, bless God, she is asleep. He giveth his beloved sleep. Her head is thrown back on the projecting wing of Grandmama's tall easy chair. Her arms are resting relaxed on its comfortable arms, her lips just open with a smile, as she dreams of something in the kingdom of God's heaven, when, as the lazy day just begins to grow gray, Tom, white with snow to his middle, holding the boat's lantern before him as he steals into her kitchen, crosses the room and looks down at her. What a shame to wake her! Bends down and kisses her. Dear child, how she started! At midnight there is a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Why, Tom, oh, my dearest, is it you? Have I been asleep on duty? This was her first word when she came fairly to herself. Guess not, said old Mipples. Both lanterns was burnin' when I come in. Most time to put them out, Major. Keepers must be diligent to save oil by all reasonable provision. Is the north light burning? said poor Laura, and she looked guiltily at her tell-tale clock. Darling, said Tom reverently, if it were not burning, we should not be here and Laura took her husband to see the babies, not willing to let his hand leave hers, nor he, indeed, to let hers leave his. Old Mipples thought himself one too many, and went away, wiping his eyes to the other light. Time to extinguish it, he said. But before Tom and Laura had known he was gone, say in half an hour, that is, he was back again, hailing them from below. Major, 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 an English steamer is at anchor in the cove and is sending her boat ashore. Tom and Laura rushed to the window. The snow was all over now, and they could see the monster lying within half a mile. Where would they be, Miss Cutts, if somebody had not wound up the lamps at midnight? Guess they said Merry Christmas when they see em, and Laura held her breath when she thought what might have been. Tom and Mipples ran down to the beach to hail them and direct the landing. Tom and Mipples shook the hand of each man as he came ashore, and then Laura could see them hurrying to the house together. Steps on the landing, steps on the stairway, the door is open, and not Tom this time, but her dear lost brother Jem in the flesh and in a heavy peacoat. Merry Christmas, Laura! Laura, said Jem, as they sat at their Christmas dinner, what do you think I thought of first when I heard the cable run out so like blazes, when I rushed up and saw your yellow lanterns there? How could I know, Jem? They that dwell in the shadow of death, upon them the light hath shined. But I did not think it was you, Laura. End of Story 1, Chapter 2, Part 2